Scientists at UC San Diego recently discovered that European starlings communicate using a kind of grammar previously thought to be unique to humans. The birds use whistles, warbles, and rattles, the way we use words. Grammar is a structure that separates language from noise, allowing us to know and name. Poetry is a way of playing with grammar, a special way of knowing the world that transforms the common. Eugene Schieflin was a member of a prominent New York City family descended from German immigrants. At his Madison Avenue home, he hosted meetings for the American Acclimation Society, which promoted the introduction of foreign species considered aesthetically and practically valuable. On his own, Schieflin began regularly releasing songbirds into New York City. He wanted to introduce all the birds ever mentioned in the works of William Shakespeare. Skylarks, lapwings, nightingales, song thrushes, wagtails, jackdaws. Shakespeare mentioned over 600 birds. One by one, Schieflin released them all, trying to create the world like a poet. One by one, they perished, unable to compete in the new world. During a snowstorm in March of 1890, Schieflin and his servants gathered 30 pairs of European starlings forged a path through the white expanse, and released the birds into Central Park. Two years later, a starling nest appeared in the eaves of the Museum of Natural History. Shortly after, a boy in Brooklyn threw a stone at a bird he had never seen before and killed it. In 1857, the city of New York used eminent domain to seize 843 acres in Manhattan. This land became Central Park, a domesticated wilderness in the heart of the city. It was expected that the park would improve the moral character of even the poorest New Yorkers by introducing them to the natural world. In the process of building the park, the city displaced over 1,600 immigrants and former slaves. They were described as vagabonds and scoundrels living off the refuse of the city. They scattered to other places, leaving no trace of their lives on the land they left behind. Park planners use the term desire lines to describe the informal paths that emerge over time. After a fresh snowfall, paths disappear and people forge their own trails. Desires you can see. Many streets in old cities began as desire lines. Broadway was once a Wapani trail which Dutch settlers made into a street in the 17th century. Its imprint deepened over time. Schieflin starlings spread out in waves from Central Park. Within a hundred years, they had conquered North America. It was their destiny manifest. Today, America is home to hundreds of millions of starlings. The commonest birds, they defy the logic of bird watching. 
of the seeking gaze of those who deal in sightings. There is no need to seek out what is everywhere. There are many names for a flock of starlings. A constellation, a filth, a scourge, a vulgarity, a murmuration. Murmuration, a sound you can see. In the spring of 1784, Mozart walked into a shop and discovered a starling singing one of his concertos. Amazed by the performance, he kept it as a pet until it died three years later. What are you doing? Hi! 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 Hi, Swart! Hi, Swart! Hi, Swart! Hi! Hi! Hi, Swart! Hi, sweetheart! At the burial service, there were veiled mourners, a procession, hymns, and even a poem written by Mozart himself. Hier ruht ein lieber Narr, ein Vogelstar. Noch in den besten Jahren musst er erfahren des Todes bitteren Schmerz. Mir blut das Herz, wenn ich daran gedenke. There is something alluring about nature mirroring ourselves back to us. What you doing, Amos? I love you. Hmm? Huh? I love you. I love What you do? What you doing, Amos? What you doing, Amos? I don't know. I love you, Mama's. Yeah, my Mama's. Yeah, my kiss, Amos. Yeah, my Mama's. Yeah, my Mama's. Starlings are remade each moment. Spotted black and white in the winter, they shimmer green and purple in the spring. Their language morphs with every sound they hear. Machines, cars, alarms, cell phones. Starlings interpret their world, mocking the idea that nature is static. In January of 2009, thousands of dead starlings dropped from the New Jersey sky. Dairy farmers had complained that flocks of starlings were stealing food from their lots. The Department of Agriculture poisoned the feed, and within days, dead starlings rained from the sky. The snow imprinted small graves around their carcasses, which peppered the lawns of residents. Over the years, we've tried to check these overly successful birds in a variety of ways, each more gruesome than the last. Helium balloons, firecrackers, rockets, flare pistols, shotguns, propane explosions, artificial owls, chemicals derived from peppers, chemicals that cause erratic behavior, chemicals that cause kidney failure, chemicals that freeze them to death. Starlings are accused of being noisy, overpopulous, ugly, greedy, thieving, murderous, pushy invaders. They're not from here and they're taking over. But starlings need the world we made. They thrive in domesticated landscapes like lawns, parks, and highways. Their presence traces a history that we'd rather forget.
In his attempt to play with the grammar of the natural world, Eugene Schieflin accidentally caused one of the most spectacular environmental disasters in the history of the United States. He looked at the world with desire and discontent and tried to introduce poetry to it. Instead, he introduced the starling. He died in 1906, mercifully unaware of his legacy. By now, his family has locked up his photos and vaulted his grave. But his name still echoes in the murmurations that roll like waves across the American sky. Ha, <laughs> ha,